Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me before I begin. So if someone can just write in the chat that you can hear me, then we'll start. OK, thanks, Amar. Thank you. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's nice to meet you. My name is Yasmin Rashid, and I am a newbie here in Texas. Um, I just moved here from California about two months ago. Um, and it's been quite a transition. Um, I have some notes written down that I might refer to. I have another screen here. So if I look over here, that's why. Um, and I was thinking about kind of what I wanted to say during the reflection. Oh yeah, I also wanted to uh, put a timer on <laughs> to make sure I don't go over because I can really lose myself sometimes. Okay, Bismillah. Um, yeah, and I was thinking about what I wanted to reflect on um, and I really want to talk about shame. Uh, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Al-Fatihi liman aghliqa wal khatimi liman sabaqa nasir al-haqqi bil-haqqi wal-hadi ila sirataka al-mustaqim ala alihi haqqi qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wahdana uqta min li istani fqahu qawli. So, when we think of the word shame, uh, we kind of conflate it with the word guilt. Um, and I really want to kind of distinguish the two um, in a really great way that I, I love that's been worded is from one of my favorite researchers and speakers, uh, Dr. Brene Brown. I highly recommend looking into her work if you've never done so before. And she says, shame is, uh, guilt is I did something bad. And shame is, I am bad. And from her research, she said that shame is highly, highly correlated, end quote, highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you need to know. Guilt is inversely correlated with those things. Guilt is a catalyst for change. And shame is a catalyst for debilitation. Um, another book I, I would really highly recommend that everybody read is a book called Mistakes Were Made, parentheses, but not by me. And it's a book that goes into the research and the explanation and the psychology of why people seem to do things that are absolutely horrible and are able to justify it and live with themselves. And it's not just the extremes. It goes to show that human beings are actually not very rational. Um, we're not very, we behavioralists would always think that human beings are either wired for, you know, um, a positive reinforcement or a negative one, but it's a little more complex than that. And one of the things in the research that I really wanted to bring attention to is something called, uh, it's something called cognitive dissonance. Um, and cognitive dissonance is defined as a state of tension that occurs whenever a person holds two cognitions, ideas, attitudes, beliefs, opinions, that are psychologically inconsistent. Dissonance produces mental discomfort ranging from minor pangs to deep anguish. And most specifically, dissonance, cognitive dissonance was studied to show the reason why people would react to certain things in certain ways and how they justify certain behaviors that are incongruent with their beliefs. So we want to believe that we are good people. So sometimes instead of admitting that we did something wrong, we go and we justify the issue, the, the problem that we did. We start living in this kind of denial because of the cognitive dissonance between who we think we are and what we did that is not consistent with who we think we are. And I think the root of this, and it doesn't say that in the book, but I think that the root of all of this is shame. That we don't know how to separate guilt and shame. That we are so, we feel so much shame for something that we did wrong. That we actually begin to believe that what we did wasn't wrong because if we admit that we're wrong, that that thing was wrong, then we admit that we are wrong, we are bad. And the inverse is true. Some people believe that they do so much wrong, that they are so bad, that they are beyond repair, that we are beyond Allah's love and forgiveness. 
And I really want to segue this in to the reason why we're all here. And it starts with the story of Adam, alayhi salam. And a lot of us get the story of Adam wrong. We actually tend to conflate with the Christian narrative that we are on this earth as a punishment for what Adam and Hawa did. But the reality is, is that we're not here as a punishment. So the story goes that Shaitan convinced Adam and Hawa to eat from the tree when Allah told them not to do it, right? And they listened to Shaitan. They went and they did it. And I'm going to quote from Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Surah, Surah Baqarah, Ayah 36 and 37. But Satan caused them to slip out of it and remove them from that condition in which they had been. And we said, go down all of you as enemies to one another and you will have upon the earth a place of settlement and provision for a time. Then Adam was inspired with words of prayer by his Lord. So he accepted his repentance. Surely he is the acceptor of repentance, most merciful. And there's other areas in the Quran that talks about, repeats this story, that once Adam and Hawa committed this, their first transgression, their first sin, Allah just taught them words of repentance. And then he accepted it. And then they went to earth. So how is it a punishment if Allah accepted the repentance of Adam and then put him down to earth? There is other reasons, right? There are other reasons why we are here. And it's for our growth, ultimately. It's for our nearness to Allah. It's for us to exercise our free will and to acknowledge that we are imperfect. And so what happened at the time of Adam was actually what I call the divine practice session. The divine practice session was Adam messing up proving his imperfection, going with his desires, doing something wrong, and then asking for forgiveness and then receiving it. That's it. And that was a divine practice session for what we are meant to do. Now Allah was like, go to earth and do that over and over and over again until you return to me. SubhanAllah. And what did shaitan say? He said, I'm going to keep deviating Adam from your path as long as I'm alive. I'm going to keep deviating from your path as long as I'm alive. And what is the way of shaitan? I don't know if you have heard this before, but the way of shaitan is despair. So when we start feeling immense shame about something that we have done, about the mistakes that we have made, when we start having this cognitive dissonance of, I thought I was a good person, but I did something that I'm not proud of. Shaitan uses that. He loves that shame. Cause he'll do one of two things. Go, oh no, no, you're, you're a good person. You had to do this bad thing. This bad thing isn't even that bad. People have done way worse. You're fine. So the cognitive dissonance between who we think we are and what we've done now comes together. Or Shaitan will be like, you're a horrible person. You know that? How, how dare you do this thing? You are not worthy of Allah's love. You shouldn't even, why are you even bothering to pray? Why are you even, you've missed so many prayers already. Why do you, who, you think Allah is gonna accept that from you? You think you have any right to speak about Allah's love or speak about Allah in a positive way to other people because you're a hypocrite. And so you fall into despair in another way. So I want to re refer again one more time the difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. And ultimately we know we are not bad because that is not our fitra. Fitra is our essence of who we are. Of It is the, the instinctive nature of who we are when we were born. And according to our tradition, 
We are born with a clean slate, pure. And then we follow our nufus, you know, our nafs is our ego. We follow our nafs, we follow our nufus, right? Nufus is the plural form of nafs. We follow our egos, we follow, you know, we get, we fall into shaitan's really brilliant psychological philosophical debates. And so we mess up. And we have a sense because we're still in touch with our fitra as we're growing up, we start believing, oh, like that's wrong. And then from there, depending on how we're raised, depending on how our community responds to mistakes, depending on how our parents respond to our mistakes is how we start responding to those mistakes within ourselves. So if we're used to, if we were grew up and we were used to being told that we're bad and we're wrong, we're stupid, we're worthless, then that becomes, our guilt becomes shame. It becomes self-debilitating shame. Or if we grow up maybe being self-aggrandized, like we are told that we can do no wrong, we can get away with anything, there's no consequences to our behavior, then we can start lying to ourselves or denying when we've done something wrong or feeling so much fear and shame that, oh, I guess I'm not as amazing as I thought I was. Then we start rationalizing the bad behavior, the, the bad uh, mistakes that we have made. And I wanna talk about the word insan. It's a panel, this is, this is so, so intentional and so important. But the word insan, um, for those who are not familiar with the Arabic language, Arabic is a language that is built upon a triliteral root system, meaning each word, it, each word is made from a derivative of three root letters. And those root letters sometimes have a different definition than the actual word, but they're always linked. There's always a reason why. So the word insan, which means human, has the triliteral root letters of na, sin, ya, nesia, which means to forget. Human beings are extremely forgetful. I mean, we forget Allah all the time. We forget to recheck ourselves and to have self-awareness all the time. Why do you think Allah has us praying five times a day? Because we forget him so much. And even within the prayer, we're forgetting him, subhanAllah. And that's why salah has so much repetition in it. We're constantly saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar in your salah. That's probably the most frequent thing we say in our salah. And what is Allahu Akbar? We always translate it as God is great, but God is great is not an accurate translation. Allahu Akbar actually transla translates to Allahu, Allah is greater, Akbar. Greater than what? Than everything. And ultimately in the word Akbar, the word greater is also embedded in it is the greatest grammatically in Arabic. So greater than what? Whatever your mind was wandering on in that moment during Salah. So you're praying and then the whole, you know, the chatter, the, as they say, the monkey mind starts chattering away. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the monkey mind in, in meditation. The monkey mind starts chattering away, but then you say, Allahu Akbar, God is greater than whatever my monkey mind was thinking about. And if anyone is familiar with meditation, um, just a quick, recap about what meditation is and, and mindful meditation specifically. There's a there's so many different forms of meditation and they derive from a few different regions in, in the world. Uh, but what we uh, what we know in the West as mindful meditations become very popular is that you have to connect basically with your breath and with your body and have a kind of conscious awareness of your breath and your body. And what happens is, and this is what where the word monkey mind comes in, your, your mind 
chatters. So you, you'll be sitting with your eyes closed, you know, being conscious of your breath. And you just, that's, that's basically meditation. You just sit for however many minutes and you just try to keep aware of your breath and your, and your body. And when you follow uh, a meditation, like a guided meditation, um, I highly recommend Headspace uh, for anyone who is interested in trying it out. It's, um, it's really beneficial. But the, the narrator will say, you know, we'll, we'll get you into a space where you're sitting and you're, you're meditating. And then the narrator, narrator will tell you, okay, now bring your awareness to your breath. And then he'll pause. And then he'll say, and then you'll, your mind will start wandering. And he'll say, and when your mind wanders, just gently bring it back again. <laughs> and then you, oh, you're like, oh yeah, okay, back to my breath. And then your mind starts wandering. And then he says, and then when your mind wanders, just gently bring it back again, right? This is Salah. Salah is a form of a meditation, but instead of being mindful on your breath, and your body necessarily, you're mindful on what you're saying, which is Allah. Which is why it's so important that we actually learn the translation and the words of what we're saying when we pray, especially if you were born Muslim, you kind of are just like, you're going with the motions, you were taught to memorize these words and this, this worship, but you have no idea what you're saying. I mean, think about how absurd that is, right? That we're just like, we were taught to say something and then we're not consciously aware of what we're saying and we're told to do it five times a day I mean we have to we it's 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 an imperative on all of us to do our research and to look into the translation and and the symbolism of what all of our actions and and um, the words that we're saying mean because how can we be mindful on something when we don't even know what it means Now, that's not to say that there's no way you can be mindful of Allah if you don't know Arabic, but it, it helps, right? And it, this, is, this is a commandment that was given to the Rasul in the realm of Allah, in the realm of the Jabarut. Like there was an ascension that the, the Prophet ascended to the heavens to receive this, this commandment. Everything else was brought down to him. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel came down and the Quran was revealed to him, um, uh, was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ either through Gabriel or through visions, like things like that, right? But this is the only thing that was revealed where the Prophet ﷺ had to go and ascend. Prayer. And again, back to Arabic as being extremely... Um, articulate back to the triliteral roots that I was talking about salah is the word for prayer and salah derives from the triliteral root letters sa lam ha or or alif I I, I don't remember the the third uh, letter um, someone correct me in the chats if I'm wrong what, on what it is but it, it, it can it's the the word is sila which means to connect salah prayer is sila Connection. Connection to whom? To Allah. And how do we do that? Gently bringing your mind back again. Allahu Akbar. When we do, this is, you know, something a halaka teacher taught me once. I don't know it, how accurate it is what the scholars, the ulama have said about it. But when we begin our prayer, oftentimes we do this, Allahu Akbar. If you, if you have your hands in front, some people put their hands down. But we say, we do this, Allahu Akbar, right? And, and a, a halaka teacher taught me that when you do this, you're taking the whole world behind you, the dunya, throwing it behind you, say, Allahu Akbar, and God is greater. And then you enter into your prayer. And as we know, when we are in salah, when we pray, things that are normally halal, things that are normally permissible become impermissible, like eating, talking, multitasking, anything except for the prayer unless of course there's an emergency and you need to attend to it right why is that it's to remember and we are not perfect 
So when our mind starts wandering in salsa, I, my mind wanders in salsa all the time. Sometimes I finish a salah and I'm like, that's horrible. Like I wasn't present for any of that. And I should start over and keep, and shaitan does this, right? I should do this again. And I, oh, my prayers are horrible. And I'm this and I'm that. We, we start like, but Allah's not asking for that. You know what Allah's asking for? Just say you're sorry. <laughs> it's really that simple. It's, it, repentance is the most, I think like, I don't know, of, of all the religions, Islam is the most simple form of repentance. <laughs> it doesn't require anything except to really mean it and to have a private moment with God and be like, Ya Allah, I'm sorry. And you're not sorry because you wronged Allah, right? And the Quran says it all the time. And they have wronged themselves. We are wronging ourselves. We wrong ourselves when we stray away from Allah. Why? Because we need Allah. We are completely, we are finite beings living in the infinite omnipotent realm of the divine. We are in complete need of this being. So when we make a mistake and we turn away from this being, we are wronging ourselves from the life source of what sustains and nourishes and nurtures us. And the way to return is just gently bring it back again. No need for all this, we, we create layers. And that one book I really highly recommend that people read is called Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, later I'm gonna write in the chat like some of the books that I've been recommending um, the story of Adam is based on this, uh, of, of the interpretation of the story of Adam is based on this book called Even Angels Ask by Jeffrey Lang. Um, and this talks about his conversion to Islam and why he does, he's brilliant. Um, another way is, um, another one is living presence. Um, it's mind, mindfulness and the essential self by Kabir Helminski, which I really uh, enjoy. Um, Dr. Brene Brown is the researcher I was quoting before and, um, now I'm recommending the book uh, by Tara Brock called Radical Acceptance. And what she talks about is that when we feel a certain emotion, we start creating layers on that emotion. So if we feel sad, we get sad about the fact that we're sad. Like, oh no, I'm sad, this is so bad. No, I'm sad. Instead of just accepting, I'm. I'm sad right now and I'm just gonna sit with that. Or angry. We get angry at the fact that we've been angered. How dare you anger me? <laughs> Instead of just being like, I am feeling anger right now and that's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feel it and I'm not gonna react to it but I'm gonna respond to it. There's a big difference between reacting and responding, right? Same with, with guilt. And I mean, shame specifically. Shame becomes this like, it consumes us. Like it doesn't, it's not, no longer is it about the thing that we did wrong about the guilt, which is healthy. It becomes like, what does this mean that I did something wrong? What does this mean about me and who I am or about the action that I did and all this stuff. And it becomes like bigger than ourselves. And we become crushed underneath it because we forgot to look outside of ourselves and see Allah. Our, our witnessing of our own deficiencies should only make us witnesses of God's perfection. And in, in, so, in doing so, realizing that only God is perfect, realizing that we deserve grace because we deserve it, because God gave it to us. As long as we remain humble, as long as we remain with our intentions pure and sincere, then we, we deserve grace because God said that we deserve it, right? So I've only got a few minutes left and I wanna um, just end it with a hadith that I think is is really, I think, the bedrock of Islam that we, we don't really talk about that much. And this is actually the first of the 40 hadith of the hadith, hadith Nawawi. 
So Imam Nawawi is a, a very prominent, uh, I think, Shafi scholar who compiled a, uh, a compilation of 40 of like basically the top hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, many scholars have done like 40, like the top 40 kind of compilations, um, but this one is the most like well-known and it has become the most circulated and most popular. Um, and the first of these 40 hadith is Al-A'mal bin Niyat. That's the hadith, it's very short. Al-A'mal, actions, bin Niyat, are by intentions. Actions are by intentions. Meaning that it's not about what you do. It's about the intention behind it. I was speaking to a mother a month ago who has so much regret about the way she raised her child, who is now a teenager. And she's like, I should have done this and I should have done that. And I asked her, what were your intentions? And she said, well, I, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was making the right decision. And now I realize it's not. And I was like, well, but your intentions were in the right place but that wasn't good enough for her, right? There was so much crippling like shame about it. But I said to her, if you were, obviously it's a lot easier for me to say this to her because I don't have children. I don't know the weight of responsibility that a parent feels. So I'm, I'm not diminishing that feeling at all because that's, that's huge to feel responsible for another person on this earth. And, you know, and so, so many more studies are coming out about how, how much, parental influence has on, a, on an adult, right? But I said, if this was, you acted to the best of your knowledge and you were sincere in your intention, then really Allah was just in control there, not you. Allah decided this for you and for your, for your child. And that takes you a minute to really think about that because you're now admitting that you're actually not in control. And this can go into a whole discussion about free will, which we do not have time for that, which we can go into another time. But what that means is that what we are free to choose is our intention. And then from there, Allah carries it out, carries out the action, either prevents you from committing the action or guides your action into something else or guides you into more expansive knowledge. We all, we are so limited. We will always be limited, right? But if our intention is sincere, then we will trust that Allah will guide us to what is best. So if we made a mistake with a sincere intention and then we realized it was a mistake, we should feel gratitude for that because Allah decided to guide us and we were able to see the wrongdoing that we committed, that was a mistake. And we have an opportunity to turn back to Allah, an opportunity to remember, oh yeah, I'm human and that's okay. And there's a, there's a hadith, uh, and I'm butchering it, but I think it's a hadith Qudsi where it says, if, if the son of Adam came to me with sins that was like uh, the size of the mountains and asked for forgiveness, I would forgive him. And if he returned to me with two mountainfuls of those sins and asked for forgiveness, I would forgive him. It's really that simple. And may Allah give us grace and um, the ability to have, have grace with ourselves, with the people around us, to forgive ourselves and to forgive others, to stop judging ourselves and judging others and just see actions for what they are as good or bad and not definitions of the people. I mean, and Osama, I've never done this before. So if I'm just supposed to like leave the Zoom chat, <laughs> let me know <laughs> what happens after this. Don't worry, you can stick around. <laughs> I'm okay. just gonna switch the spotlight. Sure. So I'm like everyone, yes, mean, thank you very much, Zekala. That was uh, awesome. Uh, great reflection and reminder. I hope you can stick on for a little bit so we can all uh, get a chance to chit chat a little bit. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, announcements. So uh, tonight is week two for the Prophet and I, uh, keeping the Sira relevant. It's a weekly course on basically going through the Sira 
uh, in different parts of the bi prophetic biography and lifting up the historical and religious significance of each event, but using context and to relate it to the world today. So last week was the first session, and this is the second one. It's outstanding. I highly recommend you all take the time, if you can, this evening to join. It's from 6 to 7.30. It's about an hour. Uh, and then that last half hour is a conversation, kind of a Q&A and reflecting. Uh, it's very, uh, it's outstanding. It's on Zoom. It's online. Um, next, is the uh, Spiritual Connections Group. Again, uh, every uh, two weeks, it's either on the second the fourth Tuesday, it's on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month, along with the second and fourth Sundays. It's a group of 10 to 10 members, 10, two to 10 people, which will meet together, basically centering around the Islamic value of suhba or companionship. And the form, the form for the express purpose of encouraging each member to foster and develop their spirituality, as well as a sense of companionship. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's hosted and uh, led by in house chaplain Osama Malik. Go to the website if you're interested in joining this. It's Sunday mornings and Tuesdays, so Tuesdays and Sundays. Uh, don't forget, you can uh, sign up and do some office hours with uh, uh, Osama, with Chaplain Osama, basically to talk about any issues with faith, life, relationships, identity, challenges, uh, crisis of spirituality. Uh, there's seven days a week, so just go on the website and sign up for that. And then last thing is the last program is for ages 18 to 24, a program called The Functioning Muslim. Uh, it's on Thursday. The next one's Thursday, uh, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, it's a group that's aiming to connect you with other like-minded individuals of, in the hopes of fostering community connection and personal growth. Uh, there are going to be facilitators there to help you achieve your best self. This month's session is going to be careers, inventory, choices, realities, and possibilities in the discussion. And that's pretty much it. Uh, last thing is go on the website. There's opportunities to volunteer. There's a shoe drive and a work morning that's going on at uh, 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 being part of Hill Country Community Ministries. You can uh, sign up for that. And that's pretty much it. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Yasmin, that was great. Thank you.